Hey art nerds, it is an absolutely gorgeous day outside, so I am outside again recording another watercolor tutorial for you guys. This one is short and sweet. I'm going to show you how to paint beautiful yellow roses on hot press watercolor paper. I should, I think I have a line art for this, so I'll make sure to link that in the description below. And I'll also be up on Patreon if you want to download it, print it out, and paint along with me. This was inked using a Sakura Pigma FB brush pen. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to secure my watercolor paper to a stable surface. I am using cardboard chipboard for this. This was scavenged off the back of a different watercolor pad once I used it up. And I am using some washi tape just to tape it down to prevent it from buckling and kipping too much. You could also use clips for this or if you wanted you could use washi tape on the front. But I found that with hot press paper when I remove the washi tape it does tend to tear the paper surface. So generally I prefer to use it on the back. I'm painting on Fluid 100. This is a cotton rag hot press watercolor paper. I happen to really like this paper. I also happen to really like Stonehenge's hot press watercolor paper. The difference between hot press and cold press is all in how they finish up the paper. So once they've already poured the paper pulp into the mold and they're ready to start kind of smoothing it out, that's kind of the difference between handmade paper and mass produced paper, they will run hot press paper through hot rollers and that gives it a really smooth, almost the same kind of finish as a Bristol, whereas cold press paper is pressed when it's cold and that leaves it with a lot of texture and a lot of absorbency. So how you paint on hot press and how you paint on cold press are a little bit different. Hot press doesn't take washes, doesn't take layers quite as well as cold press paper, and it also doesn't take granulation as well. So if you're the kind of artist who wants a lot of sort of misty, wet into wet blends, if you really love granulation and you enjoy super granulation where you get those two different colors granulating out separately, hot press paper is not the watercolor paper for you. And I talk about that a lot more in my Stonehenge hot press versus cold press video where I talk about the pros and cons for both. Both papers are great, they just have a different use case. Hot press paper is a lot easier to ink on and if you're interested in getting into watercolor comics and you want to work on a cotton rag paper, hot press might be the way to go. So for this I'm establishing my shadows my cooler colors. I'm painting in the shadows on the white eyelet lace and I'm using ultramarine blue for this. A really watered down ultramarine blue just to kind of set that base color. You could also use grays. Really kind of depending on what your local color looks like, you can use a very watered down desaturated version of that color to paint the shadows on your whites. I don't like leaving white fabric, white paper, that sort of thing, just straight up white. I do like putting a base color down and then adding in shadows. To me, it just creates a more finished watercolor illustration. So I am painting this using my Daily Driver watercolor palette. I apologize that you guys can't see it, but it is most certainly there. And I talk about my Daily Driver watercolor palette a lot here on the channel. I'll make sure to link that if you guys are curious, but it's basically a collection of all the watercolors I've reviewed that I happen to really like. So it's a variety of different brands and it's kind of just my favorite colors from each brand. So I talk about that a little bit more in a World Watercolor Month vlog from a few years ago. Not a whole lot has changed. I, I don't actually switch the colors out too often. I just tend to add in more colors. And I'm actually looking at converting my palette to a big old empty Derwent Inktense tin and using magnets so I can have like a major half pan palette. So to mix Kara's skin tone, I used yellow ochre with a little bit of scarlet. This is kind of a standard basic Caucasian skin tone mix. It works for a variety of ethnicities as well. You just kind of vary the proportions and if you're interested in learning more about painting skin tones, I've got some great tutorials for you guys that I'll be sure to link in the description below. So for the foliage in the back, I'm using a stronger mix of ultramarine to kind of establish in the shadows and then I'm using 
Daniel Smith's Undersea Green, which is one of my favorite colors. It's a really beautiful color. If you're using it on a cold press watercolor paper, you're going to get some really gorgeous granulation. On a hot press, though, it's really more of like a nice dark olive green. And I thought that would look so nice with the really warm yellow roses that I'm going to be painting. So I used a warm blue to create the shadows, and then I'm painting on top of that with a warm green. Now once that layer is mostly dry, I can go ahead and go in with another thicker mix of the same undersea green. And one of the things about hot press paper is that I find that the water and the pigments don't seep into the cotton rag as much as they would with a cold press paper. So if you are impatient, if you want to paint in a hurry and you still want to use cotton rag, Hot press is a really good way to do that because it has some of the same properties that a cellulose paper would have. So a cellulose watercolor paper doesn't really absorb the water, doesn't really absorb the pigments. They mostly just sit on the top. I mean, there are some, some exceptions. Like if you really, really, really saturate the paper, you can get it to absorb some water. But in general, it just mostly sits on the surface. And I found that hot press cotton rag is very similar. I also don't generally stretch hot press cotton rag when I'm working with it because I, again I find that it is not as receptive to water as its cold press counterpart so generally what I'll do with hot press watercolor paper is I'll just go ahead and tape it down I'll either do a border around the sides or tape on the back or use clips for that or sometimes I don't even secure it at all it really kind of depends on what paper I'm working with what format I'm working with so I've already started to establish some of the yellow in this illustration and I'm starting with bismuth yellow which is a more opaque yellow that is not as cool as some yellows but it's also not a particularly warm yellow it's kind of a middle of the road yellow which can make it for a very good mixing yellow but the slight opacity to it also makes it really useful for if you want to go back in and add a yellow glaze on top of something because there's some opacity to it you actually do get some glazing effects you do get some yellow in there and that's really helpful for adding highlights back into greens particularly into leaves now i'm working with a warmer yellow i actually can't remember which yellow off the top of my head it might be an azo yellow it might be sennelia yellow i apologize but it is a warmer yellow so it's closer to red on the color wheel than it would be to green and i'm using this for a lot of the base colors particularly for the yellow roses i really want them to be like almost like a yellow orange and this was inspired by these really tacky orange rose bouquets I saw at Michael's a few years ago but I kind of fell in love with just how tacky they were and I also saw this really nice why it's like rimmed eyelet lace with daisies on it and that inspired the dress that Kara's wearing so I get a lot of inspiration especially for seven inch Kara stuff from just kind of keeping my eyes open when I'm out and about in the world around me whether I'm in stores or I'm out in nature or I'm out at a place I'm always looking for inspiration and I'm always taking photos of things that inspire me so I can reference them later and it helps me remember them and uh, you know your phone is maybe not the best place for a photo morgue that's how I use my phone but it does take up a lot of space so what I used to do years ago is I used to use Pinterest to help me organize my inspiration and ideas for seven inch Kara and I actually have blog posts about that but you can use whatever works for you I know people who have used Google Docs for that I know people who use discord for that so it's whatever system you like that works for you is what I'm going to recommend so I've mixed in some India yellow now so something I really like about Indian yellow is it is a really warm yellow and it has a really wide range of tone you can get these really nice warm yellows all the way to like golden rods and tans 
And I'm kind of using this as my intermediary yellow because a little bit later on, I'm gonna start mixing in some Chinese orange to start getting the darker oranges, the more saturated colors. In fact, that's probably what I'm already doing here on the roses. So with the roses, I'm really trying to focus on only adding in my additional color, kind of where the petals meet the rest of the flower, where the petals might dip in or might be overlapped by other petals, basically where they're turning away from the light. And I'm not afraid to go heavy, to go kind of hammy with the contrast here. Sometimes I'll really try to blend that out and get a really nice smooth transition. And then sometimes I really want that strong, sharp, clean edge transition because it helps add some contrast and it can help make things pop. And hot pressed cotton rag watercolor paper can be a great option for that. I guess I ought to disclose, since I'm talking about hot press watercolor paper a lot, I don't have any affiliation whatsoever with Fluid. This was a sample pack that had been given to me at like David's Art Supply. They know I like watercolor and they threw that in with one of my purchases. And I regularly do purchase Fluid watercolor paper and in the past I've talked about it a lot on this channel, particularly when I was doing conventions and doing convention watercolors. So I have no affiliations with any of the brands shown here. These are my own preferences. It's what I happen to enjoy using. And in general, I'm not brand loyal. I like to use whatever works for me. And I really recommend that you do that as well. And if you're looking for affordable ways to kind of explore your options, there's nothing wrong with asking at your favorite local art supply, minus Michaels or Hobby Lobby, if they happen to have any samples. A lot of smaller chains and independently owned art supply stores do get sent samples, do purchase samples, and they may have them on hand particularly if they know you're interested in one type of media, they might be happy to load you down. Um, so I recommend making friends with your local art supply stores also because, you know, it's supporting a local business, it's helping a local industry, and they'll often carry things that you ask them to carry because they know there's a customer there who's interested in it. So now I have busted out the Chinese orange. I've also busted out the secondary palette. So I am painting using ceramic palettes. One of them is an actual factual watercolor palette. The other one is just an inexpensive ceramic plate from Dollar Tree. And that might be my favorite palette. I use it all the time. It is very, very useful. I used to use primarily plastic watercolor palettes. And that was mainly because I traveled a lot and I had to be able to pack everything up in a bag and fly with it. And weight was a restriction and delicacy was a restriction. So I was usually working with things that could take the flight that could take the travel. But now that I'm more settled and spending more time at home and painting at home, I don't have to worry about that as much. So at this point, I have most of my local colors established. And if you're not familiar, local color is the color you think something is for the most part. Now this can be affected by the lighting. It can be affected by the objects around it. It can be affected by the shadows, but establishing local color. And then I like to do glazes either underneath it or on top of it, kind of depending on what I'm painting is one of my favorite methods for working with watercolor. And if you're new to my work, if you're new to my channel, I am a watercolor comic artist and illustrator. This lady here, this little gal is Kara. She's a seven inch tall Lilliputian girl and she's the main character from my comic, Seven Inch Kara. And if you like comics or you like illustration or you like watercolor, color or you like all of the above, I really hope you will check 7-Inch Kara out. It's available as a webcomic so you can read it for free at 7inchkara.com or if you're a dead, dead tree format person like myself, you can order a copy of volume 1 and volume 2 of this comic through my online store and I'll have links to all that as well as links to all the tutorials that I mentioned earlier down in the description below. So one of the cons of working outside is you do tend to catch a lot of atmospheric noise. So if you guys can hear that train in the background, I apologize. So now that most of this painting is finished, it's time for me to go in with some white gouache and add in some highlights, add in some details. And this is one of the things that really makes me not a watercolorist because generally with watercolor, if you're a watercolor purist, you don't go back in and add highlights or add details using gouache. You let the white of the paper do that. But I am 
very fun I'm a functional kind of person I don't really care about whether or not watercolor rules say you can or cannot do something and I find that using white gouache color pencils inking pins whatever works to complete the illustration whatever helps me tell the story is what I'm going to do and honestly that's my recommendations for you guys too I don't get very hung up in what wet canvas says is the right way to do things for me reading those sort of resources that's great for like understanding something or getting your feet or kind of figuring out how to get started but what's really important is just go ahead dive in have fun try new things and make mistakes and i make plenty of art that i think is kind of ugly because no matter where i am in my artistic journey i'm still learning and i'm still trying new things and that's one of the things that makes art really fun is trying new things experimenting learning new techniques Speaking of breaking the watercolor law, I'm going back in and re-inking some areas where the opacity from the watercolors has kind of obscured the line art and it kind of makes it look a little bit muddy. I'm re-inking things just a little bit. This is adding in some new contrast. This is going to help with the clarity and it's going to help clean it up and make it look less muddy. So I'm using the same pen that I used when I inked it. This is a Sakura Pigma FB. I talk a lot on this channel about pens that are marker safe and waterproof and the Sakura Pigma FBs are one of my favorite. So once everything had a chance to dry completely, magic of YouTube, you don't have to sit and watch paint dry, I carefully remove my washi tape from the back. It does tear a little bit, but that's why we put it on the back and not the front. And there we have it, another completed watercolor illustration. I really love watercolor. It's kind of my safe place. It's kind of my happy place. It's, it's something I do to self-soothe and it's something that I just really enjoy. And I wanna make watercolor more accessible for people who are interested in the art form. So with that in mind, I have three playlists that if you're new to watercolor, I really hope you guys will check out. The first is Watercolor 101, where I demonstrate just some basic materials, some basic techniques so that you have confidence when you're trying out watercolor. Next is Watercolor Basics, where I take some of those techniques and I kind of build on them and I have some very easy to complete tutorials that you guys can paint along with. And then thirdly, I have a playlist of my favorite watercolor tutorials. And then I try, not always successful, but I try to host a watercolor live stream every Friday night at 8 p.m. CST. We're working our way through flowers, but I'm open to suggestions.